And uh, we want to go to God in prayer right now. You know, as we uh, come to this place and enter into worship, we want to just begin by thanking the Lord. So will you pray with me? O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name above all the earth. We stand in awe of you this morning. The fact that you desire to be known by us, that you know us more intimately than we even know ourselves, that you long to have relationship with us. We stand in awe of that. The creator of the cosmos, the creator of all things that exist, and you long to be in relationship with us. Lord, we come to this place this morning knowing that we have failed you in different ways, known and unknown, uh, on purpose and on accident. Uh, the things that you have called us to do, uh, we have not done those well. And so we just want to begin by saying we're sorry. Please forgive us. We know that you forgive us because your grace is amazing and never ends. But we want to say that out loud because we don't want to have anything that stands in between us and you this morning. We long to bring you glory and praise and honor, but we also long to hear from you today. We thank you for this opportunity to come and worship, to be in this place, to have this, this building to come and gather for worship. We thank you. Lord, we pray that you do speak a word to us today. And as we're listening for your voice, as we read the scriptures, as we uh, sing songs, as we give tithes and offerings, and we listen for that still small voice, Lord, we want to also uh, speak to you the things that are on our hearts and minds this morning, the things, the baggage maybe that we uh, brought in the door this morning, things that are weighing us down, that are just kind of sitting there in the back of our mind, and we just can't seem to let go of just for an hour. We want to give that to you right now. We lift up Emily and Ron and Stacy and all those who are sick this morning who could not be here because of illness. We pray for those who are traveling. Uh, bring them back safely to us. Uh, the folks that maybe are um, huddled into their homes or other places because they're still just unsure of this COVID or other illness that could potentially be devastating for them. And so because of that, they, they can't be with us today. Lord, uh, folks who are looking for jobs this morning, who desperately need income, uh, folks that uh, need to find a new lease on life, people that need to know Jesus, our family members, our friends that we know do not know you, we lift all of these to you today. And any unspoken prayer request, anything that we just don't even know how to form the words to say it out loud, but we know that it's weighing us down. We give this all to you this morning. Free us from all of that, from all our fears, from all of our concerns, so we can turn our attention and focus solely on you this morning. And then, Lord, as we are filled up with your strength and with your grace, as we depart this place and we're tempted to pick those back up, I pray that we would just... Leave it there at the foot of the cross, trusting that you know what's best for every single situation, that you are always working toward the good of those who love you. And so we trust in your goodness. Lord, may you be glorified this hour. May you be praised. And it is in the name of Jesus Christ that we offer this up to you. Amen. Come on, Jay. You already know this bit. Jay. Come on up. Yeah, don't talk with secret. Yeah, you gotta act surprised. You already know. These two were in first service, so they already know. Hi guys. Hello. Hello. Okay. What it now legend comes. Oh. You can sit anywhere. You can sit anywhere. Anywhere. Okay, what is the name? But no, you're gonna no, you can't sit there. Okay, what's the name of our church? Jimmy. Grace Church. What is Grace? Grace Methodist Church, that's right. What is grace? What is Jesus grace? Jesus and God. Jesus and God is definitely grace. But typically when we say we're talking about grace, grace is the gifts of God, right? Things that God gives us 
not because we deserve them or not because we've earned them. They're just free gifts. So things like, um, are you breathing right now? That's grace. That's a gift from God. Did you wake up this morning? Did you have cereal to eat? Grace. I did not. You did not? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't eat breakfast at all. Okay. No, His choice. His choice. <laughs> she ate six pancakes. <laughs> So, the Bible verses that we're going to read today say, the Bible verses that we're reading today say that God gives us grace, not so that we can hold on to it, but so that we can give it away. And the more grace that we give away to other people in things like forgiveness, kindness, patience, love, when we give that grace away, God gives us more grace to replenish it. It's kind of like this stream right here, right? See, if I give grace away, there's always more grace. I'm going to give some grace to you. There you go. Oh, wait. Don't, don't lose it. Hold on to that grace. There's more grace. See, look. There's more grace. Jay, grab some grace. Hand some grace to Jay. Pass it down. Pass it down. Here, take some grace. See, there's always more grace. You see that? How that works? You can steal some. Now, Jay said this morning, Jay said, man, that's a lot of grace. That's right. There's always a lot of grace. There's never an end to God's grace. But don't hold on to it. Give it away. All right, here's the trick. Here's the trick. Look, look. I just got to roll this thing in there. That's the trick. That's the bit. But isn't that cool? That's how God's grace is. Every morning, we have new grace. And God says, go out into the world and give that grace away. Don't hold on to it for yourselves. Be kind to people, and I will make sure to fill your cup with grace every morning. So I'm really glad that our church is called Grace Church, because it reminds us of that. Isn't that awesome? Okay, let's pray. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you give us grace. Each and every morning, your mercies are new, the Bible tells us. But you also ask us to give that grace away, and so we're going to ask you to help us to do that. When we are maybe feeling stingy or we don't want to offer a kind word to someone, remind us that you have shown kindness to us and that we are called to give that away. We ask that you continue to bless us, bless our families, bless our friends, bless our pets because they need it too. Please continue to bless this awesome church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I forgot. My, I didn't have my microphone turned on for that. Could you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, good. Did everybody hear you? Yep. Thank you, Jay. Our scripture reading today, uh, we're continuing in uh, 1 Peter. And so I'm going to be reading to you out of the CEB, the Common English Bible, because it just said what I thought needed to be said. It was the best way to say it. And so we're going to be reading 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Lord, we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit that our minds and our hearts are open, that we may hear with ears the things that you want to say to us today. Amen. This is what it says. Therefore... Since Christ suffered as a human, you should also arm yourselves with his way of thinking. This is because whoever suffers is finished with sin. As a result, they don't live the rest of their human lives in ways determined by human desires, but in ways determined by God's will. You have wasted enough time doing what unbelievers desire, living in their unrestrained immorality and lust their drunkenness and excessive feasting and wild parties, and their forbidden worship of idols. They think it's strange that you don't join in these activities with the same flood of unrestrained wickedness, so they slander you. They will have to reckon with the one who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Indeed, this is the reason the good news was also preached to the dead. This happens so that although they were judged as humans according to human standards, they could live by the Spirit according to divine standards. The end of everything has come. Therefore, be self-controlled and clear-headed so you can pray. Above all, show sincere love to each other, 
because love brings about the forgiveness of many sins. Open your homes to each other without complaining and serve each other according to the gift each person has received as good managers of God's diverse gifts or grace. Whoever speaks should do so as those who speak God's word. Whoever serves should do so from the strength that God furnishes. Do this so that in everything God may be honored through Jesus Christ. To him be honor and power forever and always. Amen. A word from God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, I know that we're having uh, fun this morning. I know that we're enjoying this, singing. We're energetic. We've had our coffee. Uh, but i got to talk about something today that's uh, maybe a little bit dark, maybe a little bit scary, something that we don't want to talk about. Death. We're going to be talking about death today. I'm sorry to bring it down a little bit, but this is something that uh, we all have to face, right? Death and taxes, the two things you can't get away from. Uh, the truth is, uh, unless Jesus returns before that happens, and perhaps on this sunny day, Jesus will return right now. Okay, not yet. <laughs> but unless Jesus returns, death is a reality we all have to face. You know, the biblical writers knew this to be true. Isaiah says that our lives are like grass, like uh, flowers of the field. They bloom, and then the sun comes out, and they wither and they fade and they go away. James tells in his letter, uh, he says, you know, the human life is like a mist which just appears for just a moment and then it evapor evaporates, disappears. Life is short. And I think about, you know, what we know about the history of the universe. A human life is nothing. It's just a, it's just a blip in time. Time is short. As the saying goes, time is short. Given our limited time, I think when you finally come to kind of realize this, I remember as a kid kind of getting to this place where I thought, oh, I have to die someday. That's a, that's a reality. And then you begin to think, okay, well, then what am I going to do with my time here? You know, when that becomes a reality for you as a kid, what am I going to do? And people kind of handle this in different ways. I mean, one of the ways that we do this is... Uh, we uh, want to leave a, a lasting legacy for our families. We want to make sure that our families are cared for. And so we work really, really hard to set up everything so that when we're gone, our families don't have to struggle. Life can go on for them. That's one way. Another way, uh, perhaps you, you want to seek immortality through fame. So painters, writers, musicians uh, seek to, uh, you know, try to get so famous that even after they're gone, people will be talking about them forever and ever. Other people, they look at life and say, well, if I'm going to die, well, then perhaps I should just have a whole lot of fun. I'm just going to do whatever I want. I'm going to spend my money on what I want to spend it on. I'm going to eat the food I want to eat. I'm going to go to the places that I want to go. Uh, life is all about seeking out the pleasure and doing whatever you want to do. But we don't have that luxury, do we? Because we have been set apart by God. We have been called holy by God. We are God's special chosen people called to a certain task in this life. And so we don't have the luxury of doing whatever we want to do. Because a declaration of holiness from God, just like grace, which it is grace, is not just for our benefit. We are not called holy just for our benefit. It is for the benefit of of the whole world. As God said to Abraham, you will be blessed so that you might bless the world. We are blessed to be a blessing. A declaration of holiness comes with marching orders. Amen. You guys will uh, uh, no doubt figure this out about me as we go along, but I love science fiction. I'm a little bit of a science fiction nerd, particularly uh, stories about time travel. I'm just fascinated by time travel. Uh, I, I, my favorite book is The Time Traveler's Wife. Love that book. Uh, I love things like H.G. Wells' uh, The Time Machine, right? 
Back to the Future just captured my attention as uh, when I was younger. I just was fascinated by the idea of this kind of moving around in time. I don't know if this counts, but Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, maybe. That's a time travel movie. I love the thought of it. You know, if time travel were possible, uh, scientists say there, there are kind of two theories that float around out there on how it would work out. One of the theories is that if you could go in time, backward, backwards in time, and change something, what would actually happen is an alternate universe would split off and create something new, right? Uh, this is the theory that they use in Back to the Future. So when Marty goes back in time and changes things and then he comes back to his present time, everything's screwed up, right? Because he messed it up. It created an alternate universe. So that's one theory. The other theory that H.G. Wells uses in The Time Machine is that Everything's set in stone. You couldn't change anything. If, even if you went back in time, it's like determined. So no matter how hard you try, whatever you're trying to do, it's going to work out the way it worked out always and forever. I like the first theory. I like the idea that you could change some things, that you could go back and make a difference and change some things and maybe even make the future better in an alternate universe. Unfortunately, time travel is science fiction. We haven't invented it. We haven't discovered it. We don't even know if it's possible, which means we can't go back in time. We can't fix things. We can't do have do-over, do-overs, do-overs. I mean, how many times have we said, if I could just go back and fix that thing, if I could go back and do that differently, I would do that. We don't have that option, though. What we do have, what we can do, what the New Testament writers urge us to do is to live out the time that we have doing what God has called us to do. What Paul calls redeeming the time. He says, redeem the time for the days are evil. What he means by that is save the day from being a total loss. Save the time from being a total loss. If you have a really bad day, start off with a really bad day, and it gets redeemed in the middle of the day so that by the end of the day, you go, wow, this was a good day. Ended up being a good day. That's what he's talking about. Redeem the time. Peter says something very similar in our text today. He says, you've wasted enough time doing what unbelievers desire living in their unrestrained immorality and lust, their drunkenness and excessive feasting and wild parties and their forbidden worship of idols. The end of all things has come. Therefore, be self-controlled and clear-headed so you can pray. Above all, show sincere love to each other because love brings about the forgiveness of many sins. Open your homes to each other without complaining and serve each other according to the gift each person has received as good managers of God's diverse gifts or grace. The word is the same there, gifts or grace. Now, you may have noticed that, that Peter says the end of everything has come. I need to let you know that both Paul and Peter and most of the New Testament writers, if not all of them, believed that the, the return of Jesus was imminent. Any second, it's going to happen. Just hold on a little bit longer because Jesus is coming back. And so you can sense the urgency that they had. Time is short. Jesus is coming back. Live out the rest of the time, whatever time that is that you have before Jesus returns to live the way that God wants us to live, to be the light of Jesus in the world. Hold on. He's coming back. But then... Ten years turned into a hundred years, and a hundred years turned into five hundred years, and five hundred years turned into a thousand, and a thousand turned into two thousand, and Jesus has not returned. And so I think that what has happened over time is that sense of urgency, maybe that those first Christians felt, has begun to drop off. The urgency is not quite there. We don't look to the skies and think that Jesus could return at any minute. If he hasn't returned in 2,000 years, why should he return in the next five minutes? 
The sense of urgency is gone. And so what I think has happened over time as that urgency has been weakened and lost, that the church then began to, well, not do such a good job in the world. I don't think it's a secret that, that we have maybe done a poor job of reflecting the light of Jesus over the course of history. I mean, think about the wars that have been fought in the name of Jesus. Think about uh, the morality that has been uh, pressed on other people in the name of Jesus. We had a 30 years uh, religious war, you know, during the time of the Reformation. For 30 years, they killed each other in the name of Jesus because they weren't living rightly. You know, you, you, it's just like, we've done some terrible things in the name of Jesus. And then I look around at this generation, the, the, the generation of my children and your children and your grandchildren. And, and I see that the church and all that comes with it is by and large being rejected by millennials and by Gen Z. They just don't see the value in continuing uh, with a institution that has caused so much harm in the world. And so church is being rejected. In fact, for the first time in history, I don't know if you know this, but not too, too long ago, uh, statistics were released. For the first time in American history, there are less of people sitting in church this morning than there are sitting at home. We as churchgoers, as worshipers, are now in the minority for the first time in American history. Before now, the bulk of people went to church on Sunday. There are more people sitting at home this morning. That's new. And it's sad. Because I see that the church is, or faith maybe, is losing its luster for some people. And I think about Paul's words to redeem the time. Redeem the time. Turn this around while you still have a chance. And I wonder, can we redeem the time? I don't know. But I think as God's holy people, as the church, we have to give it a go. We have to try, right? I mean, this, the calling doesn't ever stop. It doesn't matter how many years go by. Our calling is the same. We have to try. But I think to do that would mean that we have to get rid of some of our human ideas of what the church is supposed to look like. We've tried this, and it's not working. There are some things, and I, I'm not going to try to say what they are today, but there are some things that we have to drastically change, some things that we might have to get rid of. We might need to look at the values of the first century Christians who felt that strong sense of urgency to live rightly before Jesus comes back, we might need to get back to some of those things and adopt some of those things. And so I'm thankful that we're reading through Peter's letter, maybe looking at what did they value, these folks that had such a sense of urgency. Today, Peter says, you need to be self-controlled and clear-headed so that you can pray. We are to be a praying people. Part of our calling is to pray which is a two-way conversation. We're not just talking to God, we're listening for God. And if your head is not clear, if you're not self-controlled, you're probably not going to hear the things that you need to hear or say the things that need to be said. Be self-controlled and clear-headed so that you can pray. Peter says, above all, above all things, love one another and forgive each other. This is the second time he has asked us to do this. Second time in his letter that he asks us to love one another above all things. Because he says, love covers over a multitude of sins. And I look at the UMC right now, which is in uh, a downward spiral. Right? We're in the midst of splintering, splitting, fighting. And guess what? The world is watching as this is crashing. And I think, boy, we're not giving people a very good reason to consider Jesus. Above all, love one another. 
I don't care what problems you have with each other. Love each other. Work it out because the world is watching. Peter says, show hospitality to one another. Open your homes without complaining. Invite people over. Have dinner. Sit down. Enjoy each other's company. Model community. If you love one another, show the world that you love one another. Don't let this be the only place that you see each other. Go out to dinner. Show hospitality to one another. Let's show people what real community looks like. And finally, he says, serve one another with the grace you've been given. Just like I told the kids. We have grace anew every single morning. These wonderful gifts from God. And God says it's not just for you. Don't just hold on to this stuff. Don't worry. There's more grace where that came from. Give it away. Show kindness to people. Be patient with people. Show them a smile. Hold the door for somebody. Show grace. Empty out your cup of grace and I will fill it up again. Don't worry. There is grace anew. We are stewards of God's grace. We may not have the ability to time travel. It's true that we may not be able to go back in time to change things, but there is no doubt, both scientifically and spiritually, that we have the power to change the future. I mean, just from a purely uh, scientific viewpoint, listen to what a physicist Aaron Freeman says. He reminds us that after you're dead, long gone, dead, all the photons that ever bounced off your face... All the particles whose paths were interrupted by your smile, by the touch of your hair. Hundreds of trillions of particles have raced off like children, their ways forever changed by you. At any given moment, particles are being changed, their course forever altered by you. And when you're dead, those things will still be going in the direction that you sent them, out into the universe. That's just science right there, right? As Christians, we, we may talk... In, in spiritual terms, and say every human that you encounter, every person that you come across, they either meet the grace of Jesus Christ in you or that grace is hidden. But either way, they leave that encounter forever changed. I mean, think about something small. He talks about particles hitting your teeth and going off. What if you were to smile at somebody at the grocery store that was having a really bad day you just sense God saying, show some kindness to this person. Be patient with them. You smile at them. That smile affects their day, and they go home, and maybe their kids at home that were going to, uh, you know, maybe be talked to in a rough manner now is softened, and those kids are talked to in a different way. And those kids, their day has changed. And the way that they go out and, and treat their neighbors and fellow friends in the neighborhood is changed. We don't know how the risen Christ within us can affect the lives of other people. Maybe someday in eternity we will know the chain reaction that happened. I'm hoping that I, you know, we'll get to see some of those things. And we'll go, wow, I had no idea. And Jesus will say, yeah, that's why I told you to be my hands and feet in the world. That's what I, I was serious about that. It's not just people too. I mean, it's, right, it's all of creation. Right? We, have, we have been called to be stewards of God's creation. Look at this out here, right? We, we can treat this with contempt or we can treat it as stewards of God's good creation and it will affect generations into the future. That's real stuff. Like we have the ability as the hands and feet of Jesus to affect real change for the better or for the worse. It's up to us. And I think about this all the time. Like, I don't even know why God would choose to do it this way. I think about how Jesus came, and Jesus was healing folks, and Jesus was loving on folks and feeding them and, like, healing their wounds. Jesus dies and is resurrected. Like, Jesus was doing a great job. Why can't he just stay around and continue the work? Just, just keep doing what you're doing, and we'll just follow you. But Jesus says, no, I've got to go away. 
I've got to go away. And when I go away, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is going to remind you of all the things that I've told you. And the Holy Spirit's going to empower you to do even greater things that I have done. And I go, but Lord, you know me. I make mistakes all the time. I'm selfish. I'm lazy. I'm conceited. Are you sure you want me to be the presence of Jesus in the world? Me? Jesus did a much better job. And God says, no, this is my plan. Like, this is how I do it. My people, which I have called holy, are now the presence of my son in the world. This is how I'm going to do it. Okay. Okay. As long as you know I'm going to make mistakes. I know you're going to make mistakes. Okay. This is how God has chosen to do it. To fill up our cups with grace each and every morning. And then to have us freely give it away by the end of the day so that God can refill that cup for the next day. Urging us to pray with clear minds, to love, to forgive, to show hospitality, to serve one another, to make the most of the time that we have left. That's it. Like, that's the calling. That's what it means to be a holy people. I was reminded of uh, meditation, this uh, prayer that St. Teresa of Avila wrote. And every time I read it, it, it just gives me pause because it's sobering. It's like, yeah, that's the reality of what is happening here. I want to read this to you. This is what she says. Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks, compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes, you are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. That's a little daunting. That's a little scary. Except we're reminded that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit for this very task. Can't argue with it. It's the reality of things. Daunting, yes, but doable or else God wouldn't have said do it. Some of my favorite lyrics, one of my favorite songs, the chorus goes like this. These are the days we've been given. What will you do with each of them? What will you do with your one wild life? Let's pray. God, what will we do with our one wild life indeed? I pray that we will say yes to that which you have called us to do. That you have given us the gift called holiness, grace, forgiveness, mercy, peace, healing, eternity. And now, armed with these gifts, you have called us to go out into the world to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And we're not going to lie, we're scared. We're scared. Sometimes we're stingy. We just want to hold on to those gifts for ourselves and just enjoy life. But you've called us to roll up our sleeves and to get out there and to be Jesus in the world. So we're going to ask for your strength today. We're going to ask for extra grace because we need it. But we trust in you. We trust in your plan. And we desire to be those people. So we thank you for the calling. We thank you for the gifts. Be with us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Guys, I hope this has been helpful for you. You know, I, I, I don't want to like uh, bring anybody down with talk of death. What I hope to do is light a fire under you. I hope to bring a sense of urgency. 
Because even if Jesus doesn't come back in the next, next five minutes, our lives are uh, just a blip, right? And we have a great potential, great things that we can do. So let's go out and do them. Let's be the church that God has called us to be. Amen? Amen. Fantastic. Will you grab the hand of the person next to you? Receive this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. May you know that you are perfectly loved, you are completely forgiven, and you are uniquely empowered. Now you're called to go out into the world and live as God's faithful children. As you do, no doubt you're going to make mistakes, because we all do, but I need you to also know there is nothing you can do that would make God love you any less. There's nothing you can do that would make God love you any more because God's love for you is not based on your performance. Amen and amen. God's love for us is based on His amazing grace to which there is no end. There's always more grace. That's the best news that you're going to hear. That's the gospel message. And so I hope that you will leave here today believing that because I think it could change everything. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, please take that good word and go from this place in peace.